La emisión está comenzando. Todos los asistentes están en modo de solo escucha. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here on behalf of the Envisa Forum. I want to welcome you all to our webinar series on human rights and the environment. I am Diego Choa, Envisa Forum Communications Advisor and will be your facilitator during this second session in the series dedicated to human rights, business, and biodiversity. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar will focus on links between human rights and business. We will explore UN Global Compact initiatives that address the issue of human rights. Using examples from destructive industry, we will also discuss the impacts of business on both the conservation and development agenda from a human rights perspective. I want to welcome our facilitator today, Dr. Balakrishna Pisupati, who will be in charge of the development of this session. Welcome, Dr. Bala, and thank you to you and our speakers for sharing your knowledge and experience with our practitioners. Before starting, I would like to remember some rules and dynamic of this session. Microphones will be muted during the presentation. Please, this reduces interferences and facilitates the communication. We will have two hours presentation, I'm sorry, we will have a one hour presentation followed by 30 minutes of questions and discussion. Please send us in advance your questions or raise your hand in the control panel of GoToWebinar. If you want to speak and the connection allow it, we will open your microphones during the Q&A session. As many of our participants are not English native speakers, me included, I would like to remind our speakers the importance to talk slower. This fosters the comprehension among, among our practitioners around the world. This session is recorded and it will be available on the NBSAF forum website, uh, nbsafforum.net. All the participants will receive an email with a link to watch it, as well as a PDF copy of the presentation and a list of resources related to the topic. Don't forget to visit our YouTube channel to watch this or any of our previous sessions. Now, I will transfer the webinar to Dr. Ballet. Please enjoy the session and welcome Dr. Bala. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, uh, for joining. And certainly, it's a great pleasure for me to be welcoming you for the second in series of three webinars we are organizing in partnership with uh, the United Nations Environment, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, the Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, who together host the NBSA Forum, the SWEDBIO at Stockholm Resilience Center, the Forum for All Law, Environment, Development and Governance based in India. And first of all, let me thank all the presenters as well as those joining us for this particular webinar. As Diego was mentioning in his introduction, this particular session will focus on the topic of human rights, business and biodiversity. And very quickly, I'd like to take you to, to two components before I hand over to our presenters today and introduce the presenters in a minute. Many of you who have joined us probably are aware of the increasing focus and their attention. The human rights dimension is receiving nowadays with respect to environment and biodiversity conservation and management. And the focus actually has been reinforced with the appointment of a special rapporteur by the UN whose main terms of reference was to look at the links between human rights and environment. Mr. John Knox, who has been appointed as a special rapporteur, submitted his report in terms of links between human rights and environment. And some of us have had an opportunity to work with this particular process through the Human Rights Commission and also a few of the UN agencies. This particular webinar series has actually been in place to discuss three sets of issues related to human rights and environment. The session that we had last week, which is 29th of March, looked at the overview on human rights. It links to environment and biodiversity. We have had colleagues from the UN environment based in Nairobi, 
who provided us an overview as well as a historical perspective of how this entire discussion was formulated and it evolved into its present day situation. I also had some reflections on the report of the UN Special Rapporteurs on Human Rights and Environment. And we did discuss to a certain extent on the rights, the human rights and environment and biodiversity in terms of the rights based approaches to conservation. This particular session will focus on the business perspectives of human rights, environment and biodiversity. And all the speakers will be focusing on the links by providing both case studies and their own experiences based in on the field as well as at the global level through platforms like the UN Global Compact. We have this particular webinar session that will be followed by the last in a series of three sessions. And the last session will be held on the 19th of April, where we'll be discussing very specifically on the links between human rights and biodiversity in the context of ongoing discussions within the Convention on Biological Diversity, especially at a time when negotiations and discussions are beginning to happen to redefine, to reset the CBD strategic plan 2021 to 2030, as well as to review and update and upgrade the current global biodiversity targets that are already available. So we also will have discussions at the next webinar, which will focus on providing inputs into the post 2020 process of the CBD. But more importantly, all the three webinars would also link up with the issues of sustainable development goals, not only in terms of specific goals like SDG 14, SDG 15, and SDG 13 and climate change, but importantly to SDG 16 that looks at access to justice, development, peace and justice and, and, and issues related to that. So that's basically a kind of a quick overview of where we are and what we discussed last week and what we'll be discussing this week and what you can expect to hear from us next uh, on the 19th of April when, when you join us for the next and the last session of this particular series of webinars. So with that, I'd like to uh, in, introduce a set of brilliant panelist speakers who are with us very distinguished individuals who've done a lot of work in the area of human rights environment, biodiversity and development. We'll have uh, Dr. Puran Chandra Pandey, who will be following me as the first presenter in this session, who is currently the Managing Project Director at Dialogue for Civilization Research Institute, which is an international think tank based in Germany. Prior to that, he was the Executive Director at UN Global Compact Network India, besides being a working group member of human rights and labor of the United Nations. He initiated and led the UN Global Compact Accenture's CEO Survey and Water Index, and also was very heavily involved in developing the DNV Sustainability Guide, the KPMG Sustainability Matrix for Industrial Sector. He's also on the board of the World Food Program Trust, the Volkswagen Foundation, John Hopkins University a very distinguished panelist and a presenter for today. And personally, on my behalf, as well as on behalf of the Abisa Forum, we are very grateful for Dr. Puran Chandra Pandey to have agreed to join us and, and share his ideas and experience. He'll be followed by Ms. Shalini Ayanga, who is an environmental lawyer and educator based in Bangalore, India. She's a faculty at School of Law, Environment and Planning at Sisti Institute of Art, Design and Technology, where she teaches law and policy courses on sustainability, resilience, climate change and heritage. She's also taught at the Indian Foreign Service Academy, the National Law School of India University, the International University College in Turin. And she was a guest lecturer at the Rodborn University, Netherlands, and was a legal consultant to the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. She'll be followed by another very distinguished speaker, Ms. Uh, Dr. Claudia Ituate Lima, who is an international environmental lawyer and a researcher, who is advising at Swedbio at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Her work focuses on transformation of international law, in particular biodiversity, climate change, and human rights law into new governance forms at global and local levels. She's an advisor to the Convention on Biological Diversity, 
and also a member of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, IPBES, expert group on policy tools and methodologies. And she has directly provided its expert advice to the human rights special rapporteurs on the human rights and environment reports. And she actually will be making a presentation also on behalf of her colleague, Dr. Per Stormberg, who is an economist at, on the policy, at, at Policy Analysis Unit of Swedish Environment Protection Agency. He researched widely on an economics, development, and environment in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Per currently focuses on ecosystem services, climate change, and biofuels. And he has been a researcher at UNDP, OECD, the UN Economic Council Commission for Latin America, IAED. He also headed the Sustainable Development Governance Initiative at the United Nations University Institute of Advanced Studies. With those introductions, uh, once again, I'd like to thank all the presenters as well as those who are joining for the webinar. And we'll hand over the presentation responsibility to Mr. Puran Pandey. Thank you so much, Bala, for being so kind and in introducing me to uh, both the audiences and to our colleagues uh, who would be uh, sitting at different places. Uh, and I'm really grateful to you for roping me in for uh, this particular and very, very important uh, uh, seminar, uh, which is being orchestrated through uh, uh, our webinar. So what I'm going to really do is uh, very briefly is to uh, set the context for um, this whole uh, issue of uh, human right, uh, environment, and uh, business. I'm sorry. I would very quickly. I'm sorry, Dr. Puran, for interrupting you. This is Diego. Can you share your screen? Because I cannot see your slides at this point. Is it okay? Hold on. I'm going to send you again the, um, hold on. Okay, you should receive the, um, the message. Then you can see the, um, the message saying that you should uh, share your screen. Did you get it? Is it there? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Is it there now? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Bala, for being so kind in introducing me and inviting me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, human rights, business, and environment. And I think there can't be a better time than now to be able to talk about it and try and establish linkages between these three very important concepts and how these three concepts play out um, at all the levels, which could be at the level of the state, could be at the level of the corporate or the businesses, and also at the level of the civil society institutions. In order for me to be able to proceed further, I would like to very quickly talk about the context of uh, the topic as a theme. Uh, so the context is uh, very, very uh, universal, and that goes back to the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights, which was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly in Paris on 10th of December 1948. And that was subsequently followed by a Stockholm uh, Convention, which paved, uh, in a way, uh, the pathway for the deliberations on environment and human rights. So that was the first very, very important uh, uh, development which came straight from the UN. Subsequently, uh, there were two other very key and fundamental initiatives, and uh, we can uh, see them in form of International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, uh, which was out in 1966. Uh, the second one was International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, again in 1966. And then these were followed subsequently by European Convention on Human Rights in 1950, American Convention on Human Rights 1968, uh, African Convention on Human Rights and People's Rights 1986. And finally, there was ASEAN Human Rights Declaration in 2012. 
So this was a very, very important development to set the agenda uh, around human rights, business, and environment to begin with. Uh, going forward, I would also like to say that there is a very, very deep uh, interconnectedness and relationship between all these three issues, uh, which constitute the core values of responsible business. The very first initiative for a more objective approach on human rights and environment world, as I mentioned earlier, from the Stockholm Declaration on Human uh, Environment in 1972, and subsequently 2005 report of the UN Secretary General also noted that the connections between these three, which is environmental protection, human rights, and to begin with the business as well, became more regularly visited after 2002, uh, following the World Summit on Sustainable Development. And that was a very, very key development we need to remember in order for us to be able to move forward uh, with regard to seeing how human rights, business, and environment really fit in some kind of a framework. Uh, going forward, I would also like to uh, mention about uh, the guiding principles, uh, which are uh, very, very important from the point of uh, view of uh, uh, looking at the whole scenario. Uh, this is the first global standard, if I could probably say, in the realm of business and the human rights. It is still remains as the single most important internationally accepted instrument for addressing the human rights issues arising from the businesses. And I have been the privy to a debate in the UN headquarters in New York between John Ruggie and also three of the African leaders. And it was all about how can the states tilt their favor towards human rights and how businesses could probably go and try and disrupt it. So I was uh, fascinated uh, the way Professor Raghi uh, tried to present his argument, uh, which really was uh, very critical from the point of view of understanding uh, the guiding principles and how subsequent developments really took place. Uh, further to that, uh, the guidelines also identified three theoretical approaches to the relationship between these uh, two very, very important concepts, human rights and the environment. And I have given some references as well, and it would be very helpful if uh, someone would like to really understand more about it. But three approaches were basically about environmental uh, concerns being a precondition to the enjoyment of human rights, which is very, very important. Uh, the second approach is about human rights being the tool to address environmental issues, both procedurally and substantively, which is very, very important to remember. And finally, the approach around human rights and how can the environment be protected under the concept of sustainable development, which is also very, very important to remember if we were to really uh, try and understand the whole idea and the concept and the framework in which these three concepts are going to fit in very, very well. Uh, these guiding principles uh, are 31 principles focused on implementing UN's uh, framework, which is uh, protect, respect, and remedy. This is something which is very, very important uh, as we go along uh, to remember, because these three pillars ultimately define the role of the states and the businesses in the process, uh, which defines uh, the duty of the state to protect the human rights, the corporate responsibility to respect the human rights, and finally, it is all about access to remedy, which is very, very important uh, in the sense that if there are any uh, difficulties or crisis being created, either by the corporate or by the states, uh, there has to be the remedy which has got to be deployed in order to uh, settle uh, any uh, difficulty which could probably be taking place at any uh, level. Uh, now, the state's duty on business and human rights, which is very, very important. It says that the states must protect against human rights abuse within their territory, 
and or jurisdiction by the third parties, including corporates or business enterprises. It should also set out very clear expectations from all enterprises domiciled in the territory and our jurisdiction to respect the human rights throughout their operations. It is all about supply chain process, which is very, very important. Every business uh, from the day they start their operations, they have to really address the issue of supply chain. Across the supply chain, there could be many areas and issues uh, where some kind of a crisis might be taking place. And therefore, it becomes the duty of the state to be able to set that process correctly and see to it that any crisis is provided with a remedy which can be quick, which can be visible, and which can also be demonstrated in terms of the overall attitude and approach of the state to be able to find solution to the crisis which might be creeping in or already be the part of the supply chain of the businesses. I will very quickly uh, uh, talk, therefore, about uh, the UN Global Compact, which is uh, uh, one of the key instruments uh, operating uh, within and across uh, businesses. Uh, UN Global Compact, as uh, we very well know, was announced by uh, Kofi Annan, uh, the, the then Secretary General, on 31st of January 1999. And it is basically a voluntary initiative which revolves around 10 basic universal principles. And these are human rights. Human rights are split into two principles, uh, followed by the labor, uh, which also follows with the environment. And finally, anti-corruption was added later on to demonstrate both the UN's approach to how uh, the supply chain processes could be taken care of and also see to it as to how can corruption destroy and uh, frazzle out uh, all the good things which all the key stakeholders might be doing in the process. Uh, what really happens after UN Global Compact was launched by the then Secretary General Kofi Annan was the MDG goals, which we all know, uh, stayed um, in operations for 15 years, and they expired in 2015 with new set of goals, uh, which are now called as, are known as Sustainable Development Goals. MDG goals were more of uh, indicative aspirations, uh, which gave some kind of instruments to um, governments, uh, civil society, and also to businesses to be able to figure out as to how can they really try and take the leadership role and see to it that they can address issues as tough as human rights, as tough as education, as tough as malnutrition, and so on and so on forth. But now we have moved from MDG goals to SDG goals. SDG goals, as we know very well, are 17 fold goals. And they start as uh, those goals which are uh, taken uh, principally from MDGs, uh, because the goals we succeeded, they succeeded during the MDG goals period. But those who did not really succeed were also captured through various processes undertaken both by the UN, the private sector, and the civil society. And now we have 17 goals, which are very, very universal, uh, which have change of human rights embedded into each one of these into each one of these 17 fold goals. So if you look at poverty, or hunger, or good health, or education, or gender equality, everything will probably want to indicate there is something which hovers around the human dignity and human rights principles. Uh, I would very quickly like to uh, talk about the SDG Goal 17, uh, which is all about Effective action approach and how can all the key stakeholders, including the state, the business, and civil society, try and do what they've been doing internally. Once they have succeeded, then they go out and demonstrate it to external stakeholders. And following that, there has to be a collective action, which means everybody has got to come together and try and implement and execute 
the approaches and the principles and make it very, very visible for everybody to benefit from that. And therefore, there are two things which are very, very important for me to mention here. And I'm mentioning it at the level of uh, India and also the level of uh, the UN. At the UN level, there are several issue areas which are being handled. Uh, one of the things which I would like to talk about is water. There has been a lot of water uh, work within the UN system and the UN Global Compact. And there was finally uh, the water mandate that was created and offered to the businesses to be able to figure out as to how can they really uh, try and join those initiatives and make their presence felt and also indicate to the world at last that there is a great role for the private sector to play in issues such as water, and malnutrition, education, and so on and so on forth. At India level, there are two very important uh, initiatives which uh, took place, and I was instrumental in both of them, and therefore I think it is slightly important for me to mention about it. The first thing that I did while I was working for the UN Global Compact was to initiate India CEO Forum on Human Rights. And uh, it went on for four years, and we enrolled about 50 leadership companies and leaders to be able to identify the issues across the supply chain and see to it as to how can they really address it from the point of view of human rights. And the second one was uh, about initiating a a uh, country level dialogue with BMW, and it was called as India Sustainability Dialogue, and that continues. And we have also been able to attract more than 200 businesses from India uh, to be able to identify issues through these forums, which are both outreach and approach driven issues. And therefore, there is a fairly high degree of traction within the companies and the businesses to be able to identify issues and address them. Uh, also, uh, goal number 17 in human rights also have a couple of uh, issues that they need to really look at, and which I have mentioned in one of the slides which has just gone by. Uh, finally, I would like to really uh, refer uh, to all these good things that are going on, which is very fine, but how can human rights be made to work, which is very, very important because we may have uh, guiding principles, we may have conventions, we may have great aspirations by everybody, uh, but how do we really make this very important and very difficult task happen on the ground? And therefore, there are three things as I said. One is something which is uh, the state uh, as a necessary uh, instrument that has got to be into the place to be able to identify issues and then provide solutions to it. It also equally goes back into the kitty of the businesses and the enterprises where they need to look at the supply chain and try and find issues whereby they can exactly demonstrate how they did it and how did that particular remedy try and affect positively people both within the company and beyond the company as well and finally flowing into uh, the people who are in the surrounding uh, with the company is trying to serve. And finally, as I said, unless they will not be able to envisage collective action, which is very, very important. And as I just said earlier on, there are three ways in which we can make the things happen. One is internalize it, first of all. Once we have done it, then we have to take it out uh, for people to look at it which means we need to demonstrate it. And finally, once we have done it, we need to really bring all the key stakeholders together to get into a collective action mode and try and outreach and uh, uh, see to it that all the people, all the key stakeholders affected are being the part of the process are going to be touched and impacted in a positive way by uh, all the three key stakeholders, which is the state uh, at its own level, business enterprises, very important because they do not only create the wealth, but they also do a lot of other things for the people, including providing employment. And civil society is something which needs to also put an oversight on these two very, very 
important uh, instruments, which is the state and the businesses. And therefore, it's very, very important that while we are into a new sort of uh, age where we have just started SDG goals, 17 core goals, and I think 16th goal is also equally important, but I think the goal number 17 is very, very important because this is where we can conjoin different forces together and try and see that we can, through a collective action, try and make the human rights work on the ground, which is not only to be talked about, but something which is more visible and something which uh, can very well be related by the people uh, into the lives. And the states can demonstrate their seriousness and businesses can also see to it that they address the issue, not only within their uh, premises, but also uh, beyond the premises. So making human right work is something which is very, very important and this cannot be done more effectively unless we can join our efforts together and bring all the key stakeholders together through a collective action approach and attitude. I would like to also say that I have given two slides which are references, uh, which could be referred to as we go along. And anybody would like to really understand more about human rights and business and environment could probably go deeper into it. And I'll be very happy at the end of the presentations to answer any questions which may be directed at me by the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Puran. Uh, so we'll have our next presenter, Ms. Shalini Ayengar, who will join us from Bangalore. Hello, everyone. Is the screen showing appropriately? Yes, indeed. Excellent. So, should I just begin then? Yes, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening from here in India. It is an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be here presenting as part of this webinar. And I very much look forward to uh, engaging with questions at the end of the presentation. Um, to begin with, my uh, presentation today is uh, primarily about the obligations that businesses have with specific reference to biodiversity. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about why there might be a mismatch between biodiversity concerns and business activities, and why it behooves businesses to be more engaged in uh, addressing biodiversity concerns in their practice. Um, I will conclude with a few sort of thoughts on the way forward as to how businesses can incorporate uh, biodiversity and ecosystem concerns within their range of field of activities. Uh, to begin with, biodiversity is a incredibly difficult term to uh, define as we have heard over the other presentations as well, especially last week. Uh, the Convention on Biodiversity defines it by looking at variability within living organisms at the species level, at the uh, genetic level, and at the ecosystem level. Similarly, ecosystem services are broadly defined as the benefits that people derive from ecosystems. And they are, again, subdivided into four categories. Provisioning, which is effectively food, medicine, um, fuel, fresh water, etc. Regulating services, which ensure that uh, uh, the climate cycle is, ma is, particularly in terms of local climate, in terms of pollution, in terms of the water cycle and soil cycles, etc. Cultural services, which refer to the aesthetic, the uh, cultural, spiritual, and religious connections with uh, ecosystems. And finally, the supporting ecosystems that ensure the rest of them work, which is primarily looking at genetic stock, habitats, etc. Uh, I won't go too 
too deep into this because this is probably preaching to the choir in terms of the audience tuning in this evening. Um, and I'd just like to say, start by saying that the explicit linkages between biodiversity and ecosystem services, or BES, and human rights was emphasized by the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, Professor John Knox, whom Dr. Bala referenced a short while ago, in a 2017 report to the UN Human Rights Council, where he described that uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services were critical for human rights, and the full enjoyment of human rights, particularly the broad spectrum, including the rights to life, food, culture, health, etc., were heavily dependent on a functioning and healthy uh, biodiversity and ecosystem. Uh, the report emphasized that states do have a general obligation to protect uh, biodiversity and ecosystems, and also mentioned a human rights-based approach to biodiversity protection. Now, in the specific uh, context of uh, biodiversity, human rights, and business, the HRBA, or the human rights-based approach, is meant to provide a coherence because this is still a very fragmented field. And indeed, while there are references to environment, biodiversity is not explicitly often called out in several international and policy documents that have to do with business and human rights. So in the specific context of the three pillar protect, respect, remedy framework that Dr. Pandey just referenced, this means that uh, the governments have a responsibility to uh, protect against harm from uh, actions of businesses by adopting legal mechanisms, institutional mechanisms, and regulatory mechanisms that uh, prevent harms to biodiversity and ecosystem services. One such important one is the uh, the environmental impact assessment mechanisms that are now uh, prevalent in many parts of the world, although sadly they are still often honored in the breach. The pillar two, which is the uh, respect framework, is that businesses must understand, avoid, and mitigate their biodiversity impacts to ensure that they respect HR human rights. This is a positive obligation cast upon them. And finally, the pillar three, or the remedy framework, emphasizes that businesses and uh, uh, governments both have a responsibility to effect, look at effective redress mechanisms to affected communities, both from a procedural and a substantive standpoint. Uh, these also, this also means that businesses have a responsibility to cooperate with investigators when harms occur as well as a duty to admit culpability in cases where it is appropriate. Uh, however, in spite of the integral linkages between business and ecosystem services and uh, a healthy functioning set of human rights, and indeed businesses themselves, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services have been flagged as being at risk. The WWF Living Planet Index in 2016 uh, noted that there have been a 58% plunge in uh, since 1970 in the uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services available. And the um, World Economic Forum in its 2018 Global Risk Report uh, highlighted that degradation to biodiversity was one of the primary threats going forward. It is important to understand and that the risk faced by uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services are wide ranging. Uh, but however, businesses are highly dependent on them, both directly, indirect, and indirectly. For starters, uh, businesses rely on the raw materials that BES provides for their functioning, and their actions also impact biodiversity and ecosystems. So there is a very much a reflexive, uh, multifaceted relationship between businesses and biodiversity. Um, there are a variety of international institutions, the international law and guidelines on this issue, both uh, globally and from an Indian standpoint. Again, I will not uh, go too deep into this because the bulk of the presentation focuses on uh, specifically practical aspects for businesses to address. Now, the question is often why should uh, businesses care about business and ecosystem services. And indeed, there is of increasing concern that biodiversity concerns are not mainstreamed into business activity. This is for a few reasons. Firstly, firstly uh, biodiversity concerns are seen as a cost instead of an opportunity. 
This is especially the case when government regulations are not seen as mandating that all businesses must internalize externalities, which means that companies, some uh, businesses feel that if they voluntarily take a biodiversity sensitive approach, it might render them uncompetitive because of increased costs. Secondly, there is the aspect that businesses plan in short time uh, increments, three to five years, whereas ecosystem impacts can play out over much longer timescales. Thirdly, it is often the case that biodiversity risks are seen as manageable and foreseeable a business risk rather than something with a potentially catastrophic impact, which is often the way that civil society, governments or affected communities might see them. It is also the case that environmental concerns are often seen as a sideshow to the main business of, uh, fina of financial, which is involved more in financial metrics. And several businesses feel that they would be happier to focus on corporate social responsibility type mechanisms rather than make a wholesale root and branch change towards how they approach the business. Um, and finally, there are disagreements over what it means to be a good corporate citizen and the extent to which BES considerations should be mainstreamed within business activity. There are several uh, firms that would much rather put any paragraph on CSR and sustainability into their annual reports rather than make these sorts of changes that, that the international and national conventions seem to be calling for. However, from the question is, why should businesses care? Uh, and the simplest and the first possible answer is because it's the right thing to do from a moral standpoint. Today, our world is often considered as standing as a crossroads. And uh, it is important for businesses to be good corporate citizens and play their role in this matter. But there are also very distinct risks and opportunities for businesses to care about uh, business and, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. These include operational factors. Uh, for example, the likely impact of uh, degraded biodiversity is that there might be increased scarcity and cost of the services that the businesses rely upon. And more imp most importantly, it might diminish a, a business's social license to operate by creating conflicts with uh, local communities and governments. On the other hand, proactiveness in the matter of uh, BES means that there is likely to be efficiencies and cost savings. There is likely to be future proofing in this regard. There is a higher chance of stakeholder engagement and cooperation and a likely chance of improved stakeholder relationships. Secondly, from a reputational aspect, uh, increasingly uh, consumers ca are caring about the biodiversity and sustainability impacts that businesses have have on the in their functioning and uh, there's a high chance of damaged goodwill uh, in case businesses are seen as not adhering to uh, good corporate citizenship guidelines and or there is also the charges of greenwashing which can be quite negative for a company we've seen public uh, campaigns for example against unilever when it came to uh, alleged uh, questions of mercury being left in their old sites in india and we've seen that these are critical for a company to not suffer from reputational damage. Being proactive, again, builds a distinct brand identity, helps differentiate products, and increases trust and engagement with consumers and regulators. From a legal and regulatory standpoint, uh, avoiding, uh, avoiding a focus on BES is likely to lead to scenarios where regulations curb access, either for the firm in question or the industry at large. It's also likely to lead to sanctions and penalties for uh, for violations, and the and there is likely that there would be higher costs imposed on doing business in the first place. Being proactive then helps because it ensures that businesses are not caught unprepared by regulatory changes and they have an opportunity to demonstrate uh, good citizenship and mitigate legal risks. From a uh, financing standpoint, uh, there is likelihood of a reduced access to finance if uh, businesses ignore BES considerations. For example, the World Bank's equator principles, the International Financial Corporation's uh, Performance Standard 6 on biodiversity, 
biodiversity and conservation both emphasize the uh, considerations that businesses must take into account in their operation. Being proactive then allows um, access to concessional finance. It allows access to green bonds and a possibility of, of obtaining more favorable lending terms rather than being sanctioned. Um, and for several of these reasons, it is important for businesses to mainstream BES considerations into their practice. When it comes to what can businesses do, uh, firstly, there is the aspect of acknowledging a uh, global commitment and vision towards mainstreaming and articulating biodiversity concerns. This should be at the highest levels of a business, but should also attempt to be as bottom up as possible in order to attempt to be truly representative in this matter. Secondly, it is important to identify the business and ecosystem services uh, linkages, both in terms of direct and indirect impacts. This could mean, for instance, direct impacts could be the sourcing of raw materials or the actual impact of the sites and operations. But it could be a much larger view of it. It could be landscape impacts. It could be looking at uh, the potential costs across the value and supply chains and indeed of a much more expanded engagement. And identifying this as broadly as possible is important before any firm can define its strategy and goals with regards to BES. And again, uh, from drilling down from a commitment and a vision to a strategy and a goal is very important for a business to know what it chooses to prioritize and actively work towards. Such strategies and goals, again, must be implemented across the firm, across all operations, supply chain, and at every management level. It is, of course, not enough to do this. It is also important to measure, assess, and verify and in doing so, come up with clear indicators of how sustainability and uh, business and ecosystem services are being looked at. Because very often we've seen uh, businesses claim that they are compliant or green or sustainable without much agreement on what the content of these terms might mean. And indeed, for the measure, assess, verify part, it is important to engage with stakeholders across the board to ensure that there is a 360 degree view on a company on a company or a firm or a business's operations which could be both internal in terms of employees and as well as external in terms of business regulators customers uh, affected communities and so on and finally transparency and disclosure are critical in this field uh, transparency comes from um, things like the global reporting initiative for instance that uh, dr pandey briefly referenced and also in terms of being proactive for example, in terms of disclosure, it is not possible that there will never be risks or accidents or damages, but being open and proactive about it, protecting whistleblowers, for instance, is a critical aspect in order to ensure that businesses are able to live up to the commitments that they have taken on. Now, developing a BES strategy, which was referenced in the uh, previous slide, is also a multi-level process. And I'd like to talk briefly about what that might uh, include or entail. Uh, firstly, it is important to look at what BES values and dependencies of the firm are. It is important to do this from a business standpoint and also from an individual firm standpoint. And importantly, it is probably best practice to incorporate what is called the mitigation hierarchy. Now, the mitigation hierarchy functions on uh, avoid, uh, mitigate, restore, offset model. It is a four-step process, which first attempts to look at avoiding harm in the first place. To take a practical example, this could be, for example, a uh, critical wildlife habitat or a vulnerable uh, zone where businesses might simply choose not to function and site plants because it is impossible to avoid harm if they do carry out actions in that place. Secondly, the idea of mitigation. It is possible to redesign operations and practices, particularly with the aid of technology, with the aid of new and continual knowledge generation in order to try and mitigate the impacts that businesses can have have on their on, on BES related issues. Thirdly, there is this issue of 
restoration. And this is particularly important in, say, the post uh, mining landscapes, for example, where uh, very often we see that post extra uh, post mining, the fields are simply left uh, without attempts at restoring the landscape as best as possible. And finally, is the idea of the offset, uh, which fully acknowledges that it is much better to avoid, mitigate, and restore rather than look at offsets. But offsets might be an important way to ensure that damage caused is attempted to be redressed as best as possible. Uh, often, in this case, this includes financial mechanisms, which might seek to redirect funds to under-resourced areas and policies, and this is important. Firms need to set targets of minimal to no net loss of business and of biodiversity and ecosystem services, and to establish partnerships with academia, with uh, with uh, at, at international think tanks, with uh, uh, with other stakeholders in their field, with other businesses, in order to ensure that there is a holistic view at an industry-wide scale to making changes in how uh, business is done in that field. And of course, as we've just noted, global and national policy engagement is critical in this regard. I would like to conclude by outlining a few points to consider in order to look at how this debate might even develop. Uh, firstly, this issue of voluntary guidelines. And it is still an open question as to whether binding regulations or voluntary guidelines are the best way forward. Secondly, there's an issue of how the global north can support such measures in the global south, given the uh, wide disparities between resources and capacities in the two areas. Thirdly, there is a question of the legal implications of extraterritorial obligations on transnational corporations and how responsibilities can be imposed. Um, fourthly, I think it is an important question for all stakeholders to ask about ecosystem risk being seen as an acceptable cost of doing business, if this is appropriate, and where should the boundaries be drawn? And finally, given that uh, the, the Global South is still in a stage where it sees economic development as being critical, uh, how can the conflicts between intergenerational and intragenerational equity be resolved? And I'd like to conclude my presentation on this note. The following slides have a few references, which I believe the organizers will be sending out to all participants of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharani. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive presentation. And I think uh, some of the points you mentioned will uh, directly lead into our next presentation by Dr. Claudia Eduardo Lima uh, at Swedbio at the Stockholm Resilience Center, who is also one of the co-organizers of this webinar. Uh, Claudia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Bella. So the presentation today is going to address the issue of Sustainable Development Goal 16 and biodiversity, mainstream biodiversity, ecosystem services, and human rights in the mining sector. This is a joint presentation of myself and Per Stromberg. So for the last 15 years, I've been working in connecting these uh, two main topics of human rights and environment, more specifically looking at the linkages between human rights, biodiversity and climate change. And I often went to do field trips, for example, in Latin America or Africa. And when I started addressing like how good the new reforms on climate change or biodiversity were taking place, Again and again, people highlighted that if these legal advances were not synchronized with business sector, with government regulation in other sectors, specifically the extractive sector, that we couldn't get uh, very far. So just to highlight how we need to be thinking both in legal advances, but also how do we make them implementable in practice and then again how do we go beyond working in silos as uh, for example lawyers in terms of biodiversity law climate change law uh, extractive industry related regulation so i could like to start by 
thinking about what are the impacts when we're talking about biodiversity and ecosystems. And to give you a concrete example, I will focus on the mining sector. The reason is this is one of the key topics that will be addressed in the next conference of the parties of the Convention of Biological Diversity in terms of mainstreaming biodiversity into the mining sector. And here we can all be thinking of how can we also work in other areas that you might be working with. So when we think about the impacts, we often see the impacts at the project side. So if you see my slide there, it would be the, the part where it's in strong color orange. And this is the impact within the project and within the time period that the mine is commercially active. However, if we take the ecosystems approach and all the relevant, for example, guidelines that the Convention of Biological Diversity has developed, we could be also thinking then, and we need to be thinking of that if we're about to really put in practice regulation that it's in line with sustainability, be thinking about other impacts, for example, those beyond specifically the project side. So in the first case, we could have, uh, for example, within the project side, the clearing of land or pollution within the site. We're thinking beyond the site, could be needing to address this migration, for example, of pollutants from a waste site into, for example, the place where people are planting their crops or where people are bathing or where people are uh, having an urban area. If we think about induced impacts, those are not necessarily directly related to the project, but still a policy may Maker, either at the municipal, national level, um, to have an include and comprehensive development plan, could uh, be thinking of is, for example, the new residential areas by having a new mine that this could uh, generate. And number the uh, cumulative impacts, and here we're thinking in terms of uh, again uh, a policy maker that could be knowing and needing to assess that it's not only perhaps one mine that it's in the area, but it's a number of mines in the same water catchment and ecosystems. And what are the implications of that? And here we're thinking about different scales, for example, downstream, local, regional, or even cross-border between different countries, and temporal also increasing time from the project starts and also after the project has uh, closed, but that there can still be impact. So it's beyond the project. So how do we go about assessing these impacts that as we can see can go uh, beyond temporal and spatial geographical scales? So here it was already mentioned some of these key linkages between ecosystem services and human well-being and this is taken from the millennium ecosystem assessment so if we're talking again to about supporting contributions of nature to people here we could be thinking and assessing how could uh, for example the pollution of the man be affecting soil formation that is a supporting service or provisioning services. For example, these migrating pollutants uh, possibly affecting fresh water or a regulating service, water purification or cultural services, for example, if the mine or the pollution or waste derived from there, it is affecting a natural or sacred site. And we see that all these ecosystem services are feeding specifically to the constituents of well-being. And here we think about security, basic material for a good life, health, good social relations, freedoms of choice and action. So it is a diversity. And if we understand where are the linkages between them, we can, of course, have better policies and implement those regulations that we already have in so many countries that deal, for example, with environmental impact assessment to implement them in practice. 
One of the tools that uh, we have is economic valuation. And of course, some values are quantifiable, others not. Mm, some studies have been developed, for example, in terms of water purification provided by the Nekibubo swamp in Kampala, Uganda, which is, was valued at 2 million US dollars per year. We can also measure the environmental cost of certain activities. In this case, we're looking at the case study of mining. And in Colombia, in Cesar, it was assessed that approximately twice the market price of a ton of thermal coal uh, could be needed for these ecosystem services that sometimes could be thought about being provided mm, mm, freely, but they do have a cost if we don't support nature on continued providing them. So if we see mm, this uh, conceptual framework and uh, try to apply it to mining and understanding how biodiversity, healthy ecosystem and quality of life, life interacts. So we see that the mining can be an anthropogenic direct driver that is made by people that can specifically um, affect nature, have been given some examples about which services in particular, and this can have changes in nature's contribution to people. And I'm here using, as I will show you later on, the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and this conceptual framework. And then specifically have different impacts on different groups of people on human rights and quality of life. And what the framework that I just mentioned get, provide us now is with having specifically at the center of the framework, institutions, governance, and other di indirect drivers. And here, importantly, we did have all these human rights treaties in international law, regional uh, mechanisms that have already mentioned by the previous speakers at the center stage. And we would have also policy instruments such as environmental impact assessment, or policy support tools and methodologies, such as legal assessment tools or legal empowerment tools, such as community protocols or paralegals who advise their communities on how to obtain evidence on the impact that their ecosystems are having and how can they continue receiving these contributions of nature to people. So I won't go into the detail of this conceptual framework. You can go to the different publications on it. But what I do want to highlight is also this importance of this interacting across spatial scales. So what happens at the local level, it's also an outcome of what is happening at the national and global level. The same, this framework helps us see patterns and trends over time and be thinking that what we do to our current ecosystems and biodiversity is not only for us, but also for future generations. So we see that international law recognizes that every person, regardless of gender, age, ethnicity, economic conditions, have human rights of what the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity Ecosystem Services describes as a good quality of life. Likewise, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment, John Knox, has also recognized that international law also recognizes of what the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment describes as the constituents of way of being as human rights. So now we have been referring mainly to substantive rights, such as right to water, right to food, right to housing. But these are interdependent and indivisible to other human rights, specifically procedural rights, right to information, right to participation, right to access justice in ecosystem-related matters. And sometimes when 
people think about this procedural right, sometimes uh, the most obvious right is uh, freedom of speech and expression or people mobilizing, but it's less recognized. It's often this persistent work of more and more communities that are using legal means to challenge those cases where environmental regulations are not being complied with. And here I would like to draw the attention of the work, for example, of paralegals that are advising their communities and engaging with, for example, county governments and also engaging in dialogue with the different industries in terms of trying to find solutions that respect the rights of people and collectives. And this is Phyllis Omido who said that more and more people are using the law to challenge those who violate environmental rights. And by environmental rights, we can be thinking about all this combination of different rights that are relevant in an environmental context. And here, it worth highlighting also that many of those, which John Knox has uh, rightly said, are risking their today for our tomorrow they are often in risk situations. The international uh, organization, Global Witness, has uh, many statistics on that. And I, if you're interested in this specific topic, I would encourage to go and see them. And they also specify sectors where defenders who had questioned and opposed uh, certain projects uh, prior to their murder, and we have mining and oil as one of the most dangerous areas to be an environmental human rights defender. And here we also see that UN Special Rapporteurs, for example, uh, again, John Knox, but also the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Environmental, uh, sorry, of uh, Human Rights Defenders, who has also a specific report on environmental human rights defenders, or a Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, has highlighted that this is a crisis, and it's a crisis that affects us all. So then, uh, all states and also business sector, it is important that we realize this situation and have a role in responding to it. So I'm going to present the three key parts of what we say is the ecosystem and human rights framework, which we recently developed in a publication. And here is the Center on Sustainable Development Goal 16, although as the same Agenda 2030 highlights, all the sustainable development goals are intertwined. And here, what we propose is weaving the Sustainable Development Goal 16 with the human rights principles based on the UN common understanding of the human rights-based approach with the two key conceptual frameworks that I presented earlier, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Frameworks. And we see that many constitutions, which is the legal's highest the instrument in many countries already recognize many relevant rights that apply in the context of conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, such as this is regulation, attainable standard of health. Here I'm giving you some examples of the Kenyan constitution, of water quality, for example, related to what to water or food, to the right to food, water quality and quantity, to clean and safe water in adequate quantities. And here, what I mentioned earlier about the intertemporal effects, we have that certain constitutions recognize the right to a healthy environment, which refer to both present and future generations. And when we refer here to how these human rights principles that are enshrined in many of these uh, national constitutions or equivalent in other countries, how do we get them implemented on the ground? So here we have also that many countries already have very useful regulation in terms of, for example, environmental impact assessment or how to develop environmental management plans. And here, if we think in terms of mining, development then in a proper way can lead to transparency, which isn't explicitly uh, 
related to the human rights principle of accountability and the rule of law. And if we see clearly the Sustainable Development Goal 16, the subsections of this goal, these principles are enshrined also in this Sustainable Development Goal. Questions to ask is who does this environmental impact assessment? For example, consider potential conflict of interest. And as I was saying earlier in this presentation, we may have very advanced regulations, but what is very important is how do we implement them in practice? So for example, how we develop this environmental impact assessment, whether there's a space to public participation, including freedom of speech and expression, it is key whether or not we will be able to exercise substantive rights, such as right to health or right to an adequate standard of living. So questions to ask here, what are the impacts and how are they being evaluated? Establish baseline information about the current status of ecosystem services and constituents of well-being. Include the scenarios not only of the present, but also of the future and how that is affecting different groups. And for these, we have uh, very helpful guidelines in the context of the Convention of Biological Diversity, for example, the Aquacon guidelines, which state that we would mean to be looking at how potential or existing projects are affecting the land, the traditional land of uh, people. For example, if we were doing this baseline information, how could it be done in a way that their views are taken into account? And these guidelines specifically refer to community protocols and also refer to free informed consent. So we see that the, within the Convention of Biological Diversity, there are tools that we can use. Previously, it was mentioned as well, that uh, the mitigation hierarchy. Well, we see that this is uh, also being referred to in some information documents in the context of the voluntary guidelines for safeguards in biodiversity financing mechanisms, specifically dealing with ecological compensation. So again, in terms of thinking about these future expected changes, these are questions that we could need to be asking in terms of does the mining impact have enabling environment to exercise human rights? Are procedural and substantive obligations of state and non-state actors associated to mining being taken into account? And well, if we think about the principle and non-discrimination and equality, we see that specific group such as minorities or indigenous people, those who rely directly from ecosystem services may be at more risk in relation to certain activities. Or for example, women who include the girls who often fetch water, what will be their specific uh, rights in terms of affirmative action needed? So now I, I'm gonna go through a few criteria before going to the conclusions. And these are also we being not only legal, but also economic considerations and should be taken not as alone, but together with these international human rights and environmental principles and standards. So assessment criteria one is the mine inventor too risky in terms of a likely bankruptcy. And this is a question also highly relevant for the business sector itself. And directly linked to the principle of accountability and the rule of law. Assessment criteria two, are societal benefits of the project larger than societal cost without accounting for an opportunity cost? Again, it is a role of the policymaker who gets, for example, an application for a concession, who should be also thinking not only about the legal, but also the economic related aspects. And here the principle of interdependence and interrelatedness and the principle of participation and inclusion are relevant. Criteria three, does the project mean the most beneficial use of society's resources? Interdependency and interrelatedness of human rights. 
participation and inclusion. Criteria four, do the revenues from the project reach the nation's people without discrimination? So again, we see that these principles intertwine with these economic considerations. So concluding remarks, mining concessions, and here we could be thinking also about other uh, business sectors, are often granted without sufficient information about their impacts on nature's contribution to people and human rights. So here, little tools and methodologies that can help us address this gap are highly relevant. We have mentioned here a tool that, that we can weave together to assess the full environmental and human rights impacts of mining and other sectors to support sound policies. The proposed framework can help us assess who is affected by ecosystem alteration caused by mining, can help us connecting nature's contribution to people with relevant legal provisions, clarify trade-offs between different economic activities, for example, between mining and agriculture, which, as we said, we all depend from ecosystem services. And be thinking systemically in terms of how does this affect over time and across different locations. And I'd like to end this presentation by highlighting that personalizing the human rights principles in the mining decision making can help us to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 16 on peace, justice and strong institutions and also safeguard biodiversity and healthy ecosystems for present and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you for the, for the presentation. Uh, and uh, participants, uh, that actually brings us to the end of the presentations round. Uh, you've heard three very interesting, very pertinent presentation to the discussions we are having here. One that provides an overarching perspective, including a bit of history into the dimensions of business, biodiversity, and human rights. The second one that tags some of these issues more specifically to biodiversity and ecosystem services. And the last one, which looks at more specifically from the mining sector perspective, but also providing a much larger overview of issues related to both the procedural rights and the substantive rights perspectives. Uh, maybe just to kickstart the discussion, uh, I'd like to, to direct uh, three very specific questions, one to each of the presenter. Maybe I'll start with uh, Mr. Koran Pandey. Uh, uh, Purun, you mentioned about uh, the discussions, the kind of uh, uh, interest, uh, the action that has been taken uh, by private sector in terms of looking at human rights issues. And of course, if you are going to be looking at much larger multinational companies, definitely it's a part of the game, uh, not only for reputational risk, but also shareholders are something some people who actually want some of these multinational institutions and big corporations to ensure that whatever activities they do, uh, they actually are very pertinent to ensuring that human rights are not violated. But the biggest difficulty we have in many developing countries, including countries like India, is that if you look at the sheer number of small and medium enterprises and the number of people who get employed, who get impacted, who get directly influenced by issues related to business, the small and medium enterprise or in the small and medium inter industries is extremely large. But the biggest difficulty we have is that to a large extent, they're also in the unorganized or semi-organized sector. So while we are looking at a large number of studies, whether done through the UN Global Compact or the World Business Council on Sustainable Development and other platforms, have looked at major corporations and major corporate players, responses to human rights and dealing with the environment and biodiversity issues. To me personally, there is a bit of a gap when it comes to small medium enterprises, which probably will have a much larger impact than the major corporations. I'd like you to sort of respond with your perspective on how do we try to bring in 
uh, they may not be big in economic size, but they are huge in influence and huge in terms of the number of people who are either impacted or employed by this particular sector. Torun, can you hear me? <clears throat> okay, looks like uh, Torun, are you there? I'm there, Bala. I'm there. I can uh, hear sure. you now. Sure. Uh, did you hear my question? Yeah, I did. I did. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, there are three very quick uh, references to. Uh, what you said. Uh, the first thing is, as I said, uh, there is a large value chain. And uh, greater than the value chain is a very large supply chain which will cut across uh, many businesses. And you rightly said that the SMEs are very, very important because of the size, the kind of employment that they create for the people on the ground, and also the kind of uh, contribution that they make to the GDP of any economy is hugely immense. But the downside to SMEs is that there's nobody to take care of these uh, people. Uh, they're very low on technology. They are very, very poor on innovation. They can't really get any loan from the banking system because they are not very really organized. And also these big companies, which use or leverage these SMEs as a part of the supply chain and the value chain, also sometimes don't go ahead to support and help them. So SME is a very, very important segment, but a segment which is totally unorganized and is not really being taken care of by anybody. So this is the fact, and this is the reality check on the ground. Now what needs to happen? Two things are very, very important. If we were to really go ahead and try and make some difference to the situation in which these SMEs are located. According to uh, Government of India's statistics, uh, there are more than 2 million registered SMEs. And you can really imagine in a country of a billion plus people, if there are X number of registered SMEs, there could be four times more which are not even registered. So the problem is very, very crucial and needs to be tackled at three levels. The first thing is that we need to really recognize and understand the fact that we need to set the supply chain and the value chain which is being driven by very large companies. You look at the example of uh, a car company, I'm not really going to name it. Uh, you can't really imagine that how many SMEs they deploy in order to produce a car. Does a car company really uh, do everything whereby it produces a car? I mean, the whole car is assembled by more than 150 uh, small scale, or you can call them SMEs as well. And therefore they're very, very important. So three things, one, we will have to really set our fix, the supply chain systems of large companies. They're not really willing to do it because it helps them save money and keep their products cheaper. Uh, that is a difficult, difficult thing. But I'm also going to relate that to human rights issues. And this is where voluntary principles like even Global Compact, and I know when I started India CEO Forum, I had to really struggle even to get 10 companies to come on board from the day one. And everybody said human rights, the moment we open up ourselves to Global Compact uh, audit or review, then uh, it's going to be really, very, very difficult. So another thing that we need to do is to somehow outreach these bigger companies and educate them, not from the point of view of what they need to do for the SMEs, but from the point of view of the stringent uh, uh, areas uh, that they have in the supply chain, which impinges and sometimes breaches the human rights of these SMEs. The third thing is how do we really make it happen on the ground? We may have a lot of laws and regulations, a constitution, uh, guarantees everybody equality and equal opportunity. But the fact of the matter is that nothing is equal uh, when we really look at things on the ground. And therefore, we need to really try through a collective approach, uh, see to it that there are 
not only laws which are lying in themselves uh, of uh, human rights commissions or uh, governments or are just uh, sort of uh, are there in the constitution, but how do we really make it implementable in order for us to be able to see that the life of the people on the ground, and I'm again referring to the SMEs, if that can be sorted out and solved, I can assure you uh, about two and a half percent of GDP being contributed by SMEs will go up to at least threefold, which is a real statistics, uh, which was uh, uh, prepared by Accenture in its study on SMEs. So you are very right, but I think these are the three very uh, difficult situations to look at. One is that we have to fix the supply chain of large companies because they deploy these SMEs in the process of producing uh, products and manufacture uh, cars or whatever. And the second thing is that we need to really see to it that the systems are supported by the laws whereby we can link that to some kind of a human right issues and make it happen on the ground. And the final one is that we need to really activate our banking system whereby SMEs on their own merit uh, can go and receive the loan and uh, slowly and gradually they can build their own uh, systems uh, to begin with and later on, once they're empowered and educated and supported by the systems which can put more money in their own hands I think that would be the day when we can begin to move more incrementally on the pathway of ensuring that it is not only the human right issue, but it is largely the issue of not being able to fix the supply chain and the value chain of the large companies. That is something which is very, very important to remember. And we will all need to do it through collective action where you need the state, you need the large companies themselves, and you also need the civil society sector to be able to up the ante on these two and uh, tell them that, look, unless you do it, we are living in 2018 and not in 1818. Unless you make these things apply on these uh, big companies and make them accountable, make them more transparent and create some incentives for them so that they can take appropriate measures and try and fix the supply chain whereby I personally feel 90% of the crisis or difficulties or the challenges will automatically get sorted out. Thank you, Purun. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I give the floor to the participants, let me just quickly have a couple of more questions so that the participants can also start thinking about their own questions and comments because we still have a little time before we conclude. Uh, this question is directed to Claudia. Uh, uh, Claudia, I mean, this is linked to my question earlier and also Mr. Pandey's response to that, is that you alluded to the issue of procedural rights, uh, procedural issues and the substantive issues, substantive rights. So if you're going to be looking at it from a small and medium scale, a medium enterprise perspective, uh, where would you put your emphasis in terms of capacitating them, increasing the awareness? Uh, of course, general perspective will be it's more the substantive rights which are more important than the procedural obligations or procedural rights for them but linked to that would be is there any example or an experience from your work you can cite where the whether it is a mining sector or otherwise where some of these rights and obligations are balanced and they are being implemented Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Bala, for the question. As you say, I mean, a lot of these issues is about uh, capacity building as well. Um, just to give you an example in the context on the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, there was an, an initiative highlighting related issues to, to human rights uh, and connected to Article 8J of the Convention on Biological Diversity that refers to issues like protection of traditional knowledge, uh, unsustainable use, and so on. And, and there, there was information uh, workshops and so on with indigenous uh, groups and local communities about what was the content of this right, which we could uh, have both, uh, I mean, we were doing uh, 
well, in that sense, there was being done information, so we could say, well, that was helping uh, exercise the right to information uh, so people could participate better and so on. In terms of, I mean, there's, a, a, as we know, an increasing uh, green market from uh, cosmetics to uh, health products in terms of uh, eating uh, better. So when we think about, I mean, the, the business sector is not necessarily thinking about the extractives. I mean, I just gave that example uh, as one of them, but what uh, business mean it can be from uh, a startup, uh, an organic coffee. So what we found here it was that both substantive and procedural were highlighted for people as really key. And uh, when we were doing these workshops in terms of uh, capacity building, local people what they highlighted is well would you really need to go and share these legal provisions and let them know what those international human rights law and the Convention of Biological Diversity states is actually also to duty bearers. So when we're thinking about uh, capacity building, I think it's important to think in terms both of right holders here we were speaking about indigenous people local communities but also there i mean we could be thinking of the relationship with the uh, business sector from a uh, coffee fair trade coffee to others and they're thinking about capacity building of duty bearers and they highlight especially well you should be really speaking to the environmental ministry and not only to those ministries but to also other related ministries so then capacity building efforts who are done with the directors of natural protected areas in terms of highlighting this need to raise awareness that international law was also applicable in the national context. So I could say that uh, that when those capacity building of right holders and duty bears are done a complementary way, I think it's where we can get uh, much better results. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, at this point, are there any questions from the participants? Victoria? Yes, uh, well, this is Diego. Uh, sorry. Yes, yes. There, are, there are some of them. Uh, this is a question from Susan Joyce. She asked, are there any legal frameworks that require consultation to be taken into account in a meaningful way, not just a checklist procedure without going as far as the right to consent? I would like to transfer this question to our to our um, presenters, and I'm going to open Susan' microphone just in case she wants to um, explain a little bit more the, the question. Susan, can you can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you very much. Well, it was in reaction, I believe, to Claudia's um, presentation. Um, and uh, the challenge always is in the regulatory frameworks that the uh, procedural aspect dominates. And, um, and, and yet there's a lot of controversy around um, going as far as the implementation of a, of a consent component because of sovereignty issues. And I'm just wondering if um, there are any in the international human rights um, framework or in specific interpretations of that if um, if any of the presenters or Claudia know of, of a, a, a case or a regulatory framework in which um, there's some measure that the consultation process is mean meaningfully integrated into project decisions. My main uh, reference point is extractives as well, so I don't know how this might be uh, applied in other sectors. That's the, that's the gist of it. Well, I can uh, start. So I think we do have certain international treaties that specify which kind of uh, participation, so it's not a checklist. 
it, that is clearly established, uh, uh, that's firmly established in human rights law, that it should be uh, meaningful, that it should not discriminate. For example, if people do not speak a certain language and then the opportunity, for example, to comment in an environmental impact assessment and it's not understandable to people, they should be provided with information in their own language. Um, but um, here, I mean, the specific instrument, the international instrument that could apply is directly related to which country we're talking about, because we have international conventions, but it will depend whether the country has signed and ratified those conventions. The same at the regional level, for example, we have very uh, interesting interpretations and progressive interpretations of the right to participation, for example, in the context of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, or also in the African context. But again, it will depend whether the specific country has signed and ratified. Having said that, it is really important to see what is the international standards. And also when we're talking about, well, what is the duty of care? Both of states and the business sector, looking at these precedents, uh, I mean, especially if they are applicable of uh, their own country, but even if not, having that standard setting really helps to interpret national laws. For example, constitutional provisions, forest laws. There was uh, recently um, reform to the forest law in Mexico, where they specifically mention free prior informed consent in terms of, well, associated to ecosystem services. So that might be uh, just as an example that some secondary le legislation within countries are starting to uh, recognize this free prior informed consent. However, of course, as you say, it is a challenge of how do you implement it. But uh, I mean, an advance is whether the legal provision already exists. And that's why within this framework, we're proposing to look, start by looking at the constitutional rights and then go on to look at the secondary norms and really weave them with international law and policy. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. I'm not sure if any of our presenter has any other thought to add to this uh, discussion? Can I, Diago, for a moment? Please go ahead, Dr. Bale. Well, I mean, a very limited point, but uh, a point which is very uh, much related to what uh, Claudia was referring to. In India, there is, uh, I'll not really name the company. It's a very big uh, multinational company, which is also listed on London Stock Exchange and very big. They're also into mining. And they were trying to do the mining in uh, one of uh, the places in Orissa, which is uh, one of the states in India. Uh, and the matter was uh, uh, taken up. Uh, there were a lot of protests. Uh, uh, community did not really uh, want that company to come and mine. Uh, the case was finally referred uh, to the Supreme Court. And finally, Supreme Court gave its judgment that the company can mine in that particular area only if there is a consent given by the community to the company to do so. And then there was a referendum undertaken and community did not really agree to the company's ongoing activities in the mining in that particular area. And therefore, it had to be called off. All that I'm trying to say is, it is not only empowerment of those who are in the middle, but it is the empowerment of the people on the ground, and how can they really use legal instruments uh, which are binding and are also uh, supported by uh, constitution of countries um, at, at, at a level which can guarantee uh, fair play, which can also guarantee that people are equal and which can also guarantee that businesses can't really uh, run the rough uh, sword in case they don't really have social license to operate. Legal things will come and go, but companies in today's day and age are really spending a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money included uh, 
to see to it that they have everything else, but if they don't really have the social license to operate, it would be very hard and very tough for any company or any business to be able to move even an inch in the ground unless they have the support of the local community. And this is where I refer to a law which was uh, passed in 2013 uh, through the Companies Act, which is uh, called uh, CSR, um, a law which now uh, binds every company um, at a certain stage of their turnover and, and profit uh, to spend um, at least 2% of the net profit on corporate social responsibility. Uh, mining companies in India are additionally required uh, to spend more money uh, with regard to taking care of the community where they're going to be or are going to be operate with it. So there are several such cases, and I think one of the things, Bala, that you can probably take the leadership could be to also uh, find out such cases and convert them into some kind of best practices uh, case uh, booklet or something of that kind, because these examples from India or from anywhere else around the world can empower people on the ground, but they must know what is happening elsewhere in the world and how can they really learn and educate themselves in order to fight their own battle on the ground. Thank you very much, Doctor. And if I could just add to what Dr. Pandey just said. Um, Please go ahead, Shalini. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you. No, I was just going to say that uh, Dr. Pandey is absolutely right in when he called out the case in question. And in India, legislations like the Forest Rights Act and uh, the Environmental Impact Assessment notifications have expressly tried to draw linkages with international environmental law principle and the rights to access to information and prior consultation have both been invoked in that regard. So I think it's a very interesting space when you're seeing international law getting sort of transformed into local jurisdictions. Um, in another point I wanted to make in specifically in the UN ECE region, there is the Aarhus Convention, which has a broad range of uh, uh, mandates for environmental information access and consultation with uh, communities. And um, I think if effectively these will need to be realized within local context. So it is very much a bottom up process of seeing how these can be, uh, you know, enshrined within domestic laws, uh, because that is the first zone of access for affected communities. Thank you very much for, for your interventions. So we have another question from Professor Timothy Hodge. I'm going to open um, his microphone in case he wants to go ahead and... Can you hear us, Professor? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Okay, go ahead with your question and, and welcome. Um, thanks again and congratulations to uh, all the speakers. They're very important, very stimulating. Um, <clears throat> set of issues and uh, topics and, of course, challenges. Um, well, in fact, um, Professor Pandey, in fact, stole my thunder. Um, my, my, my simple question was to, of course, all the, uh, all the panelists, but was, in fact, to help identify um, case studies that are, in fact, worth studying and worth uh, possibly considering um, in terms of success or, in, in fact, in terms of failure, where we actually see a marriage and ideally a happy marriage uh, in terms of um, aiming for um, goals of human rights, business development, of course, biodiversity protection. And, and this is, it, it's a simple question, and perhaps um, I, th I do think there would be some values, Professor Pandey suggested that, uh, that maybe we could put together um, a, set of, uh, a set of cases, either worst or happy scenario cases of, of where we actually do see some attempt at, at marrying what not only are, are uh, obviously mutually uh, reinforcing uh, goals in terms of biodiversity, human rights, and business, but also seeing whether or not we do see a relationship between international instruments, whether it's on biodiversity uh, aspects or, or human rights, and what actually happens on the ground, because I think actually that's quite essential in terms of uh, local communities and perhaps in terms of subsectors and in terms of subnational governments. So thank you very much to all the speakers, and I'd certainly appreciate a response. Um, 
May I just make a quick point on that? Um, I, and I completely agree with the professor that it is uh, important to look at local case studies and see how these things are being operationalized. For example, in India, several environmental legislations explicitly reference international law instruments and or international law norms as part of the decision making process. Most recently, perhaps in the National Green Tribunal Act, I uh, also want to uh, send a note of uh, quite caution, but um, I, the problem I think sometimes that are seen as a major failure. Whereas, uh, if you look at continued governance issues in many of the affected regions, there are significant questions as to what happens when the court case is done and when the cameras go away, because the governance deficits often continue in these areas, court decisions notwithstanding. So I think there needs to also be a process of um, tracking these areas and the changes that might be happening there, along with looking at success stories in terms of the episode cases themselves. Thank you. Can I come in for a minute, Bola? <clears throat> Please go ahead, Dr. Uh, oh Well, I mean, uh, I was at the helm at the UN Global Compact in India. And we had more than 400 uh, companies of uh, varying size and turnover. And one of the things that I spoke to Secretary General in Doha was that why do these companies fare very poorly when they were to report on their performance and their indicators and metrics on human rights? Human rights uh, reporting by companies to UN Global Compact's 10 principles was perhaps the lowest. And when we talked to the companies, they tried to portray themselves as the victims. And this situation has not really improved a bit. And therefore, what Professor was saying is so true, and it can really lead us to many more questions that could be answered in the process. For instance, uh, uh, communities which are more empowered and have part their way up, uh, to gain access to something very sacred and they didn't really allow a company uh, to go and mine um, uh, unless their consent was uh, there. It is not only translating global conventions into some kind of a local application model, uh, but the challenge would be more in terms of educating uh, companies, in terms of creating dialogues between the companies and uh, communities. It would also be very helpful if the companies can be motivated uh, by all segments of stakeholders to be able to report. There could be certain uh, linkages established, which is not really being done, despite the fact that we are linking that to environmental impact assessment. It is still happens when multilateral funding is given, but when local funding is given by the banks to these companies, there are no procedures being followed. And therefore, my submission would be, and again, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier on, it would be a very good idea to take up such cases and codify them because there are many such things which are up and around, but nobody has ever cared uh, to sort of codify them and make them available for other communities, not only within the country A or B or C, but also for those who are outside a particular uh, country and some such cases happen, I think it would be serving a very, very good uh, uh, purpose if something of this kind can be taken up uh, in a very, very dispassionate way. We don't really need to do anything with, uh, with any person, but I think if this can be done, it could not only serve uh, the academic institutions, but can also become a tool or instrument to educate and build capacities of people both within the country and elsewhere in order for them to show the pathway whereby they can take their own uh, decisions and fight with the companies in the private sector, which is very strong sometimes. And many times they don't really care uh, anything for anybody unless they're challenged and defeated on the ground. Thank you. Very much. Um, perhaps I could also... Go ahead, Claudia. I'm sorry for interrupting you. 
Uh, yeah, just to uh, complement what was said before, in terms of um, thinking about the business, I'd like to also encourage to see beyond uh, large businesses to also look at these uh, small scale family, for example, agroforestry initiatives that we have all around the world, especially in the global south. For example, those growing the shadow a coffee, which is uh, good for the environment in terms of birds, for example, and in terms of giving a livelihood to millions of communities around the world and also satisfying the right to food in particular. Here I could uh, encourage you to look at the last special report of the Special Rapporteur on Right to Food, who specifically links to the issue to disasters and refers to the importance of resilience. And, and we see, for example, in Latin America, the Ross disease affecting millions of family farmers growing uh, fair trade coffee. So how could we as consumers as well, some of us living in the global north, support these initiatives, support this biodiversity, human rights interaction in a way that it's not only we're making a less negative impact in the environment and in ecosystems. So how do, can we be a positive force for sustainability? And thinking about this interconnectedness of not seeing only within the borders of a country, but also seeing our planet as the home we all, all live. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, and, and just to end in terms of uh, of case studies, I could encourage, uh, uh, yeah, this uh, sharing of stories, sharing of different cases that we have. We're also planning to apply some of the principles and frameworks that we mentioned earlier. So it is also, yeah, an invitation to, to continue this as a starting off of a broader dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much to all, all our per, um, presenters and thank you Dr. Bala for for this excellent webinar. I would like to invite you Dr. Bala to share with us uh, the final remarks on the topic or if you have any recommendation for our audience today. Thank you very much Diego and uh, thanks both the presenters and those colleagues who engaged uh, in terms of asking the questions. Uh, two or three takeaways. One, definitely there is a need for awareness raising and capacity building at different levels whether it is at the level of businesses, whether it is at the level of executive or at the level of local communities, as well as the small and medium entrepreneurs. So that said, I think the idea of pulling together a set of case studies, a set of uh, experiences, and I think it was uh, Tim who mentioned about both positive and negative experiences, uh, it should be done. I am sure that there should be dozens of them, but it's only a little bit of patience from our side and those who are both joining us as presenters and the uh, participants at this webinar uh, would definitely in their own merit have a, a few of such case studies. So pulling them together will be a very, very good and an important idea. But also what is important for us to, uh, to look at some of these issues is also not to just look at some of those keywords like human rights, biodiversity, environment principles. But there are several elements that are related to some of these discussions which where a lot of action is already happening on the ground. I think last week there was a mention of the biocultural protocols which are rights-based approaches enshrined in article 12 of the Nagoya protocol on access to genetic resources and benefit sharing. And currently if you look at the number of such protocols that are available at the community level in terms of rights-based approaches to the natural resources or biodiversity around them, you have more than 50 or 60 such uh, protocols that are already available. And to me, they also, to an extent, represent the element of the human rights interventions, both from communities asserting their rights over the resources and the land and the tenure, as well as the kind of initiatives that the non-governmental organizations and government bodies are trying to put together. But I think a couple of take-home messages from this entire uh, presentation, set of presentations here today is one, even though business is waking up to the idea of responding to human rights issues, to environmental uh, issues, and to ensuring biodiversity conservation happens in their interest, not in the interest of environment, but in their own business interest as well. 
it is very important that we actually try to simplify the messaging and try to demystify the difficulties perhaps the business sector may feel of understanding what these human rights based approaches are or what human rights are both procedural as well as substantive the second one is that we should also try to scale up some of these kinds of experiences and activities into other regions and into other sectors to see what kind of impact we can have and this is where i think the next week's uh, webinar uh, 19th not next week it's the 19th of april uh, uh, apologies uh, 19th of april we'll have the last session of the webinar where we have uh, at least uh, three uh, specific presentations that will try to link some of these issues we'll have Harry Jonas from Natural Justice will be joining us to specifically speak about the community-based perspective of human rights, including the work of uh, the uh, community-conserved areas, the bicultural protocols perspectives and all that. We also will have Professor Elisa Morgera from the Strathclyde University who will be joining us from her own perspective on the issue of biodiversity impact assessment and the related issues. And of course, I'm very pleased that uh, that Professor Tim uh, Timothy Hodges, who is uh, with us today, will be the one uh, facilitating that particular discussion. And I'll basically be looking at uh, pulling some of these threads together in the context of the post-2020 scenario with respect to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And of course, as it is emerging, certainly the discussions of the post-2020 process need to be aware of some of these issues not only that they need to be aware of the issues but they should be cognizant of the responsibilities that the negotiators would have under the convention to actually pull up a few elements of it much more prominently into both providing the basis for the strategic plan for the convention as well as looking at the reiteration or a new set of uh, uh, global biodiversity targets that are going to be forthcoming and lastly and importantly uh, we are now planning to turn the entire webinar series into a certificate course sometime very soon uh, so i'd strongly uh, encourage you to keep in touch we'll be sending an information to all the participants who have registered for the webinar series and secondly as claudia mentioned uh, we'll certainly pursue and the suggestion of both uh, professor timothy and uh, dr puran pandey and charani that we'll be trying to look at the possibility of pulling together a set of case studies that could benefit a lot of us so from my side uh, thanks to all the presenters thanks to all the participants who patiently were with us exactly uh, we are one minute to two hours now uh, to the webinar series and most importantly thanks to diego and uh, victoria for ensuring that the webinar goes in smoothly and also for all the technical support and as mentioned uh, the recording will be available and the link will be sent to all of you for future reference thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Bala. I want to also thank you and thank you the presenters for this thoughtful conversation. And also Victoria Brezhenu, who has, um, who is our um, technical support uh, during this session. Please check out our website, nvsaforum.net, to get the latest on this session, including a copy of the presentation and a link to the recording. I also invite you all to visit our YouTube channel where you can watch all sessions provided by the MBSA Forum. Stay tuned for our next session on the webinar series on human rights in the context of the CBD's post 2020 strategic plan. This session going, is going to be happened next 19th of April at 9 a.m. New York time. Please stay tuned with, for the information that we are going to send. If you want, uh, you know, more information, more information, please visit the MBSA forum or follow us in Facebook and Twitter. Remember, register or update your profile, send us your thoughts on webinar topics you would like to discuss in future session. The MBSA forum is a global partnership to support the development and implementation of effective national biodiversity strategies and action plans and BSAPs. It is hosted by the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity, the United Nations Development Program, and the United Nations Environment Program, WCMC. I am Diego Choa from the MBSA Forum. Hope you all enjoyed this session. Have a nice day, afternoon, or night. See you in a next session.